Welcome to another episode of Tank Talks, your personal think tank for all things startups and venture capital. I'm your host, Matt Cohen, founder and managing partner at Ripple Ventures. On today's show, we are talking about the future of e-commerce and the FBA roll-up strategy with COO and president of Boosted Commerce, Anton Von Ruden. With 44% of US e-commerce businesses being controlled by Amazon, it's probably not a shock to hear that thousands of new sellers and merchants are popping up every day on platforms like Amazon and Shopify. But today, we are focusing on a new kind of mega store that is scooping up the best e-commerce sellers and supercharging them with marketing, SEO support, and supply chain sourcing, among other efficiencies. One of those companies is Boosted, which has raised over $100 million from several investors, including Spencer Raskoff, co-founder of Zillow and Hotwire, among others, to purchase up to 100 online e-commerce stores over the next few years. We asked Anton what criteria his team looks for when searching for an acquisition target and how platforms like Boosted can help brands succeed after they are removed from platforms like Amazon. I absolutely love this conversation as we really get an inside look on how companies are competing in the online world and why brand awareness and supply chain efficiencies can never be underlooked. But before we get started today, I wanted to share a personal message about my own experiences when setting up Ripple Ventures First Fund in 2018 that may resonate with some of our listeners. I often speak with other first-time fund managers about their fears and frustrations when it comes to launching your first fund. And the conversation always leads to how I manage to deal with all the administrative hassles that arise when running an investment fund. This is where the team at Adoro Advisors comes into the story. I was lucky enough to meet the founder of Adoro, Brom Ricky, at a VC networking event in New York City at the exact time when I was struggling with my own back office headaches. As soon as Brom told me he had launched Adoro as a tech-first, high-touch fund administrator for emerging managers, I was completely sold. But to provide me with more comfort, Brom mentioned he was previously the former CFO of True Ventures, an extremely successful Valley-based venture fund, which he had left to start Adoro after so many new fund managers were asking for his advice on fund administration. Since my very first interaction with the team at Adoro, all my fund administration tasks have been a breeze. They are the perfect partner for any emerging manager like myself when it comes to supporting you through those initial fund one frustrations. From managing capital calls to LP documentation, all the way to budgets, tax documents, and anything in between, the team at Adoro literally does it all. That is why I'm excited to welcome Adoro as an official partner to Ripple Ventures and now Tank Talks, so other emerging managers can share in the benefits that I've been so fortunate to experience throughout my time as a venture investor. Don't just take it from me, Adoro works with top tier managers like Lowercase Capital, Homebrew, and Craft Ventures as well. Through their internally developed technology platform called FundPanel, fund managers and their LPs can access all things fund related anytime. Listeners of Tank Talks can receive a demo by emailing dev at adoroadvisors.com. That's D-E-V at AduroAdvisors.com and mentioning Tank Talks to get set up today. Now let's get into this week's episode with Anton Von Rudin, COO and President of Boosted Commerce. Thanks for joining us in the tank today, Anton. Thanks for having me, man. Nice to be here. Now, as I mentioned before, today's topic is on the future of e-commerce and the FBA roll-up strategy. And as many people know, 44% of the U.S. e-commerce business is held on Amazon. But there are small groups like yours, Boosted Commerce, that are trying to roll up the best sellers on platforms like Amazon and Shopify. So Anton, I'd love to kick things off and discuss the original concept for Boosted Commerce and how you became president and COO early last year. I met Charlie and Keith, our two co-founders, early last year, and they explained to me um, what they were um, setting out to do. And so since I was very, very early um, at eBay. I was employee number 10 at eBay Germany uh, back in, in 1999, as, as you just mentioned. And we were building the first global marketplace at the time. It was a it was a great time where we were telling everyone that there's this revolutionary new way to buy and sell a product. And um, I was intrigued immediately that um, sort of 20 years later, um, I could be back in a business model that deals with what today is the real global marketplace, Amazon marketplace, of course, has has taken over. And I remember we we used to laugh at or at least smile at Amazon because they only were selling books and CDs back then. And we had 3000 categories and it was like just such a bigger marketplace and see see where we are today. It's exciting to be back here and it's exciting to see all the amazing economic activity that Amazon marketplace you know, enables and all these great seller stories. And, and so we're looking for, as you said, the best sellers um, with amazing products that, that people love, that, that have great reviews and have had great success on Amazon. And we're combining them on the, on the Boosted platform. 
And so the model, so the way I've read it is that you're looking to buy up to 100 marketplace sellers over the next year, and then also capitalize on the synergies and advantages that your platform offers. So can you tell me a little bit about that hunting experience? Because there are so many sellers on Amazon, I'm sure. You know, you must be fielding so many inbound or looking for outbound companies on a daily basis. And those numbers keep changing and growing, but there's over 20,000 um, sellers that um, have more than a uh, million dollars in revenue on the Amazon marketplace and an incredible amount of great businesses that have been have been built there. So there's a lot of opportunity um, for us to, to do great finds. It's, 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 it's a hunting experience just as much as people are finding us and realizing that after a certain growth that they've experienced that maybe they haven't planned for, um, someone like Boosted Commerce can be a great place for them to, to exit to and, and, and the great great hands to put their, their, their baby into. And so we have built a technology platform, a large set of processes built on best practices that we've gathered from, from talks to thousands of sellers over, over the last year and uh, a, a great network of partners that we, all these brands that we roll up um, can can benefit from. And when, when I first joined, um, the goal was to acquire a hundred of those brands in I think four years. You're now saying one year, I, I think that's that's a little more aggressive than than our current plan is, but it's, it's accelerating uh, all the time because the opportunity is so excellent and, and uh, we see so many amazing businesses. And your chairman and co-founder said that Boosted wants to acquire CPG companies that he believes have the fifth avenue type of real estate on platforms like Amazon. What does he mean by that? When you think of fifth avenue um, uh, and, and the equivalent of that in, in e-commerce, in old school um, commerce, if you want um, traffic, it, it, that what it's all about is foot traffic, right? And, and it's having, um, having your store in the location with the highest foot traffic and that similar place on Amazon or in, in today's e-commerce world is the top ranking um, uh, in search results on Amazon. And so what we're focused on in the, in the, uh, in the diligence of the, the business opportunities that, that, we, that we look at is where are they, um, what, what real estate do they have? And we, the ones that, that, yeah, in the top, that are top ranking for the products that they're selling, those are the ones that are particularly attractive to us. And of course, that have thousands of positive reviews because that's that's the other the other piece that sort of traditional commerce doesn't really have. You don't see the ratings of a Macy's outside the door, but you do see the ratings of, of sellers and the ratings of products, of course, in, in, in search results on, on Amazon. And so who has built an, a great following and a lot of successful customer experiences, those are the brands that um, that we go for. Yeah, it's interesting. Like rolling up department stores is probably not as data driven as it is for your business because of how much information you can get off the platforms they're established on. You know, but you guys really focus on personal care and packaged goods. Why do you do that? We've been here around for a year, right? And so we've we've looked at many businesses and there's some some clusters that have naturally built as we uh, buy the opportunities that we were seeing. We're really focused on on great products that, that people love. It's 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 any any product that um, is is better that makes your living better. So there's there's a lot of there's skincare and products that um, you know you take every day that enhance your your life. And so, but that so, sort of just happened. We are very broadly focused in in categories all across um, the spectrum. Um, there 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 are some categories that, that are very seasonal that we don't favor as much but um, you know where we are today is just where we are today we really are way more focused on what I was describing um, great customer experiences um, great reviews um, and products that, that have this fifth avenue real estate uh, on Amazon so I'm sure everyone listening to this is thinking oh I'm just going to go out start an Amazon marketplace as a seller and I'm going to sell it to boosted commerce but there's definitely a lot more noise in that than there is just to go out and start a store and sell it. So can you describe the acquisition criteria that is typically required to even purchase an online store from founders and how many stores are you filtering through every day? It's amazing I've I've spent 
you know, 20 years in, in e-commerce and, and a lot of that time in, in the marketplace part of e-commerce, the amount of learning that I had in the last 12 months, um, I would have never been able to imagine because, yes, it sounds very, very easy, uh, but in reality, it's a real art. And many of these entrepreneurs that built these brands, they're doing a lot of magic. They're, they're amazing business people that, you know, maybe at the outset when they start have an idea of just an idea of something but then building it into a multi-million dollar brand um, on that marketplace where there's a lot of competition takes you know, a, a lot of hard hard work and it also uh, takes a lot of knowledge on, on how to be successful on this uh, on this marketplace so uh, we, we look at about a hundred um, numbers numbers rising uh, um, sellers or brands a week so a lot, a lot of there, there, as, as I said, there's a lot of opportunities for, for great brands. And, and we speak with um, a large portion of that as well, in which we learn every day um, something new about how to be successful um, on this marketplace. Well, I mean, I've read that there are 2,500 sellers that come on to Fulfilled by Amazon every day, but only 3% actually make it. So just to make it uh, is an incredible achievement, but the ones who can generate the millions in revenue are truly rare. And so a lot of people are probably thinking, oh, I'll just go set up an FBA store, make a quick buck. But that's really not the case if you look at the numbers. So what advice would you give to those who are considering setting up a store that you think is the most valuable before get go getting going? Yeah, I think it goes back to a little bit to what I was just saying about how much I learned um, in, in just a year. I think the first most important thing is to realize that you may think you know how to be successful in this marketplace, but I highly suggest that everyone just thinks again um, and um, does a lot of research and listens a lot because there is very, very particular ways that uh, make you successful um, on, on the FBA marketplace. I think that that's number one. I think number two is um, it is easier than your own warehouse business, right? Because Amazon does a lot of work for you. you. You have to get the inventory into Amazon and from there, Amazon handles everything. Most of the customer service as well because customers reach out to Amazon first, um, particularly for all the um, uh, interactions that are um, shipment based, so not product based, but it still is operationally really, really challenging. and. Um, the demand fluctuation, for example, to give one uh, to, 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 to point out one thing, demand fluctuation and the, the planning for it and having the inventory um, to fulfill all, all this fluctuating demand, that's, that's a bigger topic than people may, um, you know, may realize to begin with. And then if you add to that, that be, having this top real estate on Amazon really takes a big hit if you're stuck up. Right? So you build your way up to being a bestseller or to having a good good ranking with all your reviews. And, um, and, and then you stock out through your success if you want. But now you're uh, once, once you're back in stock, depends a little bit on how long it is, but once you're back in stock, you're not starting from scratch, but you do have to build yourself up again. So you kind of want to prevent stocking out um, at any time. And so you can imagine hard to plan, um, sometimes long supply chain uh, lead times. It takes a lot of operational um, finesse. Um, you know, you need some good tools um, and you need to spend some a lot of time on, on all these items to be really successful, st sustainably su successful. No, I mean, just looking at the numbers, only 3% actually make it. And so the ones that are making it, I mean, they are really not set it and forget it. Like you see on all these TikTok videos, people are like, yeah, I make half a million a year, just set it and forget it. FBA is the way to go. It's not like that is what you're saying. And then if it is, you know, if you do get to that level, then you probably have to compete with the Amazon branded products, basics, which I've heard is kind of eating away at the top sellers, you know, no name brands. Yeah, hundred percent. It's not um, set it up and forget it for sure. Um, and there's a lot of great, great work that um, these entrepreneurs put in uh, to be successful. Um, Amazon Basic Brands. I know that that topic comes up a lot when 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 I first talk to people about this this business model. Now, the the amazing scale of Amazon as a business itself is sort of what prevents that from being an issue, because. You know, two, three million dollars of a product sold, that's really not 
relevant to Amazon just yet. So I would say out of the 40,000 sellers or 20,000 sellers that I named earlier, there's maybe a handful that sell a product that is maybe relevant to Amazon um, and all the others are clearly under the radar. Now that can change over time, but right now that's not really a problem. A problem is more or a challenge for these entrepreneurs is more other people um, that see what they're doing and are also great at it and you sell the same product. So you need to um, differentiate yourself um, uh, as best as you can with the, with the brand, with the packaging, with the you know formulas or whatever um, you're, you're, you're selling to be successful. You know, it's really interesting to hear you say that you have to differentiate yourself with the brand and like the marketing and all that stuff you're spending on Amazon. When we describe some of our startups, we say either they're the Amazon of such and such or the Shopify of such and such, meaning they're like the white label solution or they are the marketplace. How many people really actually know who they're buying something from on Amazon? Like, why does it matter, you think? One big criteria that we look at is repeat buying. And um, there's there's amazing numbers of, of repeat purchases in many of the products, and we do uh, you know that that you have to attribute to that. Of course, they had a great experience. That's number one, always uh, um, what drives successful businesses. But then they also um, uh, have there's some sort of a um, trust that was built with a particular brand that people um, want to go back to. What is true, uh, what is true that people go to Amazon to, to search for something, so, I, so I, I forget the percentage, but a large number of product searches actually starts on Amazon um, uh, today, not even on Google, it already starts on Amazon. So they go there and then they find the product and they, they, they maybe look at price, they look at reviews, etc. You know, once they have it um, and they have the experience, um, there's a certain halo effect from the Amazon brand to a small brand that, you know, I think is, is fascinating to me as well, because a brand that people buy on Amazon inherently seems to be more trusted and acceptable than if you're finding it in your, in, in your web, on your regular website or a Shopify store. Um, and so, yeah, that, that, that's what makes building an actual brand um, on that platform um, so fascinating. That is very fascinating. The Amazon platform enhances the brand is what you're saying, rather than finding that brand on its own website that you can purchase the same product on. But Amazon, because they've maybe like verified it or they've given it its stamp of approval, makes people willing to come back and buy it more. Wow, that's very interesting. And they really do that, right? So it's not like anyone can uh, can go on Amazon and, and sell products. There's there's the registration process um, is, is not like a buyer, um, there is many more steps and listing a product similarly that, I mean, it gets, there's a lot of approval steps um, that you go through. I just want to add one more thought to that. When I first started, one of the, one of the concepts um, that we, I think all of us had was, all right, we'll, we'll, we have a brand on Amazon and then we gradually take that brand and have it sell on its own Shopify store because then we don't have to, you know, and we fulfill it ourselves, we find a fulfillment partner. I think another way of looking at it that, that seems to be uh, more worth developing is that, in fact, um, using your website to drive traffic to your Amazon store seems to be the much more successful solution because everyone has an Amazon account. It's okay to say that. And in everyone's Amazon account, there's a payment method. And so if I'm going to a small brand um, on the Shopify store, yes, it may be in the Shopify network, but I'm still interacting in paying that brand directly. Um, on Amazon, that's not a question. So the conversion of the same product in someone's cart on, their, on, on our own website versus on the Amazon platform is uh, dramatically different. That's what that platform does. And that's why it's such a great place to, to build a business. That efficiency that Amazon offers is allowing people to still want to put their product there. But I've, you know, I've heard you now say that Amazon brands that you are acquiring, your team is taking them off Amazon to get them to a more successful level, but still keeping part of it on Amazon for now. Do you think, though, that the Amazon model is starting to be deconstructed? as more sellers gain access to the tools that Amazon has been providing them to help them grow their business? And if so, what does that mean for the future of Amazon merchants? 
I don't think so so at all. Like maybe one day, but that's clearly not happening right now. I think it's still going the other way. And my last point about the conversion being high on the Amazon platform, because you don't think about payment or anything or interacting with the brand because it's Amazon. You, Of course, you just hit buy now. I think we'll have many years of, of that not happening. Now, of course, the brands, the way we look at them, we look at them as not just an FBA brand. And we look at when we, when we identify um, a great potential, we look at where else could that be successful? There's Walmart.com, of course, um, who, are, who are with a lot of effort building a similar experience. And then there is eventually also um, in the own uh, the own website and the own store uh, that we want to make successful. And for some of those brands, there's even brick and mortar that is a topic where we were like, okay, so could this could this be a brand that can be successful in regular commerce? Now, I was going to ask you that, like, do you think there's still room for brick and mortar stores in a post pandemic world? 100%. So I don't think retail as we've known it uh, is on the way of going away. Um, is, it's, is, is its place in the value chain? Is that changing or is what, what we, what we want to experience there? Is that changing? Are the expectations, cha- expectations changing? Of course they are, but it's always going to be there. And um, I, I do think that for, online brands utilizing traditional retail, that will be a development way more than, than, than it, it just going going away completely. So so for example, there's there's many digital native brands that are uh, that, that are so very successful in setting up retail distribution as well. And the key to really having that add to your um, to, to the overall value that you create, is seeing it as an extension to e-commerce and not um, the other way around. So many, many retailers that are trying to go online, and this are really, that's really, really difficult for them because they're traditionally almost like real estate companies, right? But if an online brand, an online retailer um, is using um, a selected number of retail outlets to enhance the online experience, maybe increase stickiness, maybe use it for um, for returns, et cetera, um, then that, that will, I think, be successful uh, for many years to come. For sure. I mean, that's like the Warby Parker model, but there's also more than that. You know, we've been thinking about this at Ripple where instead of retail just being retail, it becomes a hybrid model. And we're seeing this now with like Lululemon where they're converting half their store to a uh, urban warehouse to make third-party logistics more efficient for same-day delivery and have the other half of the store as a showroom. And because industrial real estate is very expensive, but retail footprint is starting to go down in price in some areas, you can use your you know, urban stores as a place to have storage for some of your online digital purchases, but still have the other half of the room be used for uh, a showroom. Do you think that's that trend's gonna continue? No, 100%. And since you say Lululemon, then we have to spend more time on Fabletics, which I clearly favor over Lululemon. I have to, I, ha- I have to with my past. The way that, for example, when we went, uh, when we made the decision to bring uh, Fabletics into retail uh, stores at, at Textile, it's an extension of the online business for all the reasons that you just uh, named there as well. And with the, with the membership model, even more so, it's a place where, uh, where we would do uh, fitness classes, et cetera. So the store is thought out to be all the hangers, all the furniture in there is on, on rollers so you can um, clean it out and have it. And, and then there's a fitness studio you know, within like five minutes. So there's many more experiences and things that you can drive in a retail store other than just selling product. And, and I do think that's the future of a portion of retail for sure. Yeah, 100% agree. And it's something that we're looking at trying to invest in at Ripple. You're not the only company doing this in the kind of roll-up strategy for online digital brands. In fact, what I read was that there is actually, I think over two, three and a half billion in capital raised over the past 12 months for acquiring ses- successful brands on Amazon. And two and a half billion of that was raised in just the first four months of this year. And so Boosted has raised over 100 million from several investors, including Spencer Raskoff, uh, co-founder of Zillow and Hotwire, with more than 50 active Amazon seller aggregators. I won't name them, but we know them out there. How does the Boosted model separate itself from all the roll-up players out there that are looking to acquire the best assets? First of all, the, the, the thing that we ground ourselves in many times is there's, uh, you know, 
somewhere between 20 and 40,000 great sellers, um, which is the market. So there's a lot of place for um, uh, for several people to be successful in this field. Um, for us, what's really, really different, and that's been our focus from the beginning, uh, because it stems from our founders, is that we are an aggregator of entrepreneurs for entrepreneurs. So one of the key reasons for me to join Charlie and Keith um, with this with this model was was and is that they are serial entrepreneurs have been very successful in, many times in in their career in building brands and building great customer experiences. They know very well, and the team that we've built knows very well what it takes um, to be a successful entrepreneur. And that's that's very different. So it's not just a, a random group of people that um, does a FBA role at play. So uh, from entrepreneurs for entrepreneurs. And then the other thing is that the way we think about the brands and the people that we buy the brands off of is is way more holistic uh, than other how other people do it. We just this week launched. Um, our boosted uh, seller circle that has several great benefits for uh, someone to to sell to boosted for you know they they get a peloton bike they you know they get a great trip and they get access to additional great entrepreneurs from our network you named a few that are that are investors in boosted so it's 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 a network of people that know what it takes to build a business that you are also part of once you once you're part of the boosted family and so um, those are a few differences on the team and setup and, and, and strategy side. And then one other one is, of course, we do take what you mentioned earlier already, like you take, we take the operational aspect and the operational challenges of running these businesses very, very seriously from day one we have. Um, and we've built, and we, we focus on being great at supply chain, being great at the, the, the performance marketing, uh, um, uh, being amazing at reven- uh, review generation and keeping rank uh, uh, on Amazon, which you know I know everyone is needs to do. It's a necessity, but I do think we have uh, some particular um, great ways that that set us apart. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to ask you. Most people would say you look like a typical private equity roll-up firm, but it sounds like you're much more. Uh, like an e-commerce operator, you bring the supply chain management, the SEO marketing, supply chain sourcing, and many more things. So with all those additional resources behind your firm and the companies you buy, how does a traditional retail outlet stand a chance competing in this fast-paced and highly digital world? I don't know, but I'm, I'm, I'm very convinced and very, um, very sure that with the approach that we're taking, and we've seen it over the past year, and the, we have about 30 brands now that we bought and integrated over the past 12 months. Um, I'm very sure that that we, we have the right strategy. There's one other thing I wanted to add to earlier. We, we One of the things we immediately do once we transition the brand, we, we bring it in our inventory management, one common inventory management system that makes it much easier to optimize all of the entire purchasing flow and also the tracking flow of inventory. All these things and, and many more um, uh, I think set us apart and set us up for 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 success for for several years to come. That makes sense. I mean, I don't I don't assume you're building your own operational efficiencies software systems. Like you must be using third parties. So, what kind of uh, software tools are you using to bring these efficiencies into the stores you're acquiring? There's many things that we actually did build in house. So, the our, our entire our entire way of defining what the best practice is for any of the processes and how we share this across the different brands and the team of brand managers around the world. All of these are proprietary and in-house. Um, there's a lot of uh, data infrastructure that we're also building in-house because Amazon Seller Central and this entire platform was never designed to run or manage uh, many brands. And so there's not really a place where you can get all your data in one place. It's very broken. So um, that's clearly something we uh, we use in-house. For our inventory management system, we use uh, Scubana, which is an inventory management system that was sort of founded on a business that was very successful um, selling an FBA. And so we integrate all of our um, uh, all of our brands onto that, and, and I know Jet, the CEO, they they were just acquired, so, so they they've been very successful in in developing a great tool. So that's the one I'll I'll happily mention. 
Thank you for sharing that. I'm sure there's a lot of listeners out there that are looking for some of the tools in your toolbox to uh, add to their uh, Amazon or online stores. Now, you just mentioned that you've built some of those those tools in-house and some of them are off the shelf. You know, it sounds like people are starting to build software that is specialized for certain efficiencies that Amazon has been offering their merchants to attract them to their platform for the last several years. Do you think we're going to see more deconstruction of those add-on services and efficiencies that Amazon provides that can now be purchased by independent online merchants that are you know, using Shopify as their main platform, but they're going to add on things from the Shopify app store? That is possibly the case. I have two thoughts to that. Number one is Amazon, and, and, and they're really great. Um, we have a lot of great um, conversations with many different teams at Amazon who they know that they're a little bit behind on some of the some of the things that I mentioned, data infrastructure and things, and they're they're clearly not done making the platform great, and they know that. Which when Amazon's not done, that means uh, if they're serious about it, it's going to be really great. Um, and so there's a lot more coming uh, that way. On the other hand, yes, there will be. Uh, I mean, there's there's tools and efficiency software that that you can use that is not Amazon proprietary. But the reason why it's great to build a business on Amazon outside of all the tools and outside of the great fulfillment uh, access, um, it's demand. And so as long as most product searches and more and more product searches start on Amazon, I think Amazon's the place that that for me is, um, that's only going to change once product searches go somewhere else. Right. It's, the ship has sailed for people to think about going somebody else. It's already built into their habit loop of going to Amazon. So unless you replace that with something else, it's going to be hard. You know, and habits change, right? So so uh, habits change over time. Um, I know Amazon is trying everything to not make that happen. Walmart is doing everything to make that happen. So is Shopify. And, you know, they're, they're, they're very strong players in this field. But I, de- deconstruction sounds so, so strong. I don't, I don't, I mean... There's, there's maybe additional, you know, uh, complementary other platforms, but I, I, you know, when you when you look at how strong and, sol- and, and and solid the demand is on the Amazon platform, then I don't think that's that's going to go away. And actually, going back to the beginning, this level of product searches used to be done. There was a time when it was done on eBay. We know that habit changed. Yeah, you saw that firsthand, and now you're seeing it happen as well with Amazon. The good news is I only saw it when it, I was only there when it actually was happening, when everyone was searching there. So I've not seen it, I've seen it happen on the, from the outside. Yeah. Not the deconstruction side. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like we have one question here from Susanna. Go ahead, Susanna. Hi, thanks guys. Um, joining you from the UK. I'm very interested in what your thoughts are on Instagram pushing the shopping platform so hard in terms of e-commerce. Thanks. Anything that social um, networks are doing to push commerce um, is something that, of course, everyone has to has to 100% stay on top of. Now they've been they've been doing this for a while. That's Facebook strategy with that. It's something um, that many of our brands also are looking at and following um, very very closely. You know what part of the um, wallet, what wallet share that will initial, uh, you know, eventually have. I don't know, but it's for sure something we take very seriously, and everyone I think has to take very seriously because you know there's those are very very powerful networks, and a lot of people are on them, and so we, many of our brands also um, have a very focused Instagram um, representation as well. Now, what about the uh, live streaming part that we're seeing on Instagram and TikTok and like kind of trying to be their own shopping networks? What do you think about that? Everything that's sort of an experience that converts into into buying um, is is something to to be taken serious. And and, and everything that sort of changes product selection, um, if you're there at the beginning, um, you're very likely to be successful. There's a similar example on the Amazon platform where... They just, I think they just launched video advertising um, like, and, and not that long ago, but conversions with video advertising versus just a steady uh, aesthetic picture um, are much higher. And so, I mean, you need to focus when you're an entrepreneur and you're building a, uh, you're building a brand new year and you're on maybe two people and you really need to focus. You don't have so many hours uh, to spend. But if you can, trying these and 
and staying on top of it, um, I think is, is very important for anyone that wants to be successful in e-commerce. Yeah, I completely agree. I've fallen victim to those videos that I've seen on Amazon for sure to buy something versus just a static image. So that is completely true. And how crazy it's 2021 and it's just a video, you know, so it's really not even uh, uh, anything yeah, crazy. It's not augmented reality or something. It's just just a moving picture. There's a lot more um, that will come uh, in, in, in the coming years. You know, I want to ask you how you guys were affected by the pandemic. I read that in March of last year, Boosted did not bid on any companies for about 45 days. And then it became apparent that Amazon was the go-to store for everyone around the world. And so your team started up again. But how did the pandemic affect the valuations and the seller's willingness to be acquired? The willingness to sell at the beginning of the pandemic was, of course, much higher because there was a lot of uncertainty, right? And in uncertainty, of course, people um, are, are excited to take something that's very certain and we make them a really great offer for their business and, and we have the cash to pay for it. That's very certain versus who knows what the pandemic will bring. But in, in general, of course, we all know that um, COVID in the last two years has catapulted um, the development of uh, or the, the growth of e-commerce so much forward that that's no news. And, you know, and we don't have to repeat much of that. Now, what was for a short period of time, and it's, it's, it's slowly easing, a big, big, big impact is an operational piece, and that is the supply chain, the strains on the supply chain everywhere. Um, there was a, for, for a long time, particularly on the Amazon platform, a lot of restrictions for non-essential goods that had a big impact on many, many products because there's only you know very limited number of essential goods. Um, and that had impact in receiving those items, getting them back on shelves. Um, of course, the pandemic put a big strain on the, on the Asia supply chain. So lead times could easily have doubled uh, for certain products. That's a big, uh, that was a big impact. Outside of sort of the, um, you know, challenging parts, um, it's brought more people onto the Amazon platform. You know, there's more people at home, there's more e-commerce and out of e-commerce, most people go to Amazon. So it's an amazing, it's, it's an amazing win to draft in. Well, yeah, I mean, it was built for volume and scale. Uh, so it was like stress tested all the time when there wasn't a pandemic. So they were probably at the head of the pack when something like this happened. Now, do you think there's going to be a move to re-onshoring the supply chain going forward? Or do you think we'll revert back to the global supply chain we're used to? It, it seems to me just from the past five to 10 years of experience that it will continuously be a challenge for the supply chain to um, hold pace with all the growth. When you hear about a container shortage, that's a shortage of the actual containers, not even the ship. There's no, not enough containers to load things in. Um, at a certain point in some of the ports, I think a few years ago, there was a chassis shortage, which is the trailer that the container gets put on just to move it around in the port. So if those are challenges right, right now, um, they're not. they're not high tech, they're not anything really complicated there. They're actually steel, in fact, both of them. To me, those are indications that there is a lot of catching up. And I think uh, there, there will be uh, challenges for quite a while because the, the stream of products that moves around globally, I, that's, not going, that's not going down. So you know, and, and some of the additional e-commerce growth, um, which is all mu moves much faster, um, you know, it's maybe uh, em emphasizing the, these challenges uh, yet a little more. So there'll be challenges for a while. And let me name just one other one. We talk about Amazon as this amazing platform and, and everything's working so well and demand is great. Amazon it itself has an incredible amount of scaling challenges uh, um, themselves. I think they, they opened 100 new fulfillment centers last year. I think there's 400 now. So that would have been a 25% growth in a year. And I would have to validate those numbers, but it's somewhere in that range. And that shows you they're scaling like crazy and they're trying to catch up with the demand that's even on that platform. So I think some of those challenges will be here uh, uh, for a while because the pace is just incredible. 
Yeah, and it just proves that no matter how much technology brings in terms of efficiencies to the supply chain, there still is a real world element that we cannot get away from. Like you just said, if there was a shipping container that was not available, you're not getting any of those physical goods to you that could be life-saving. And that just shows you how much you still rely on the, the physical supply chain, even if we move into a more digital uh, supply chain focused world. You know, I wanted to ask you, because you've spent so much time there, what's going on in the German tech ecosystem these days? And what should people in North America who may not be so familiar with it be aware of? The key challenge from my experience uh, um, uh, directly in that, uh, you know, in, in, in the tech ecosystem in Germany, the key challenge that you have is scale. It remains to be scale. I'm more focused on what the challenges are, but people can be aware of those as well. Uh, but I, th I think it's scale. The market that you're, uh, um, if, if you're launching, um, for example, in the in the German market, then there, there's 80 million Germans. That's your market. Um, 50 million of them are online. So um, that's a very limited number, and that that again drives the challenge in getting capital. There's very few, but you know some great examples of, of companies uh, uh, out of Europe there that are very successful and they're also successful on a global scale. But that's one thing that I feel like the um, the ecosystem there is is still having challenges in, in 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 shaking off. And then the other thing that's not as established is the VC market. So um, the, the the way American VCs look at financing great ideas is very different and far less conservative than uh, anyone you can talk to in Europe. And that that has hampered the, the growth uh, uh, quite a bit. So I know that all of the all, many of the big companies like, like Porsche and, and um, uh, for example, they, they build incubators. And so there's a big drive. Uh, Volkswagen, I think, has one as well. So everyone's building incubators. And that's uh, and there's a lot of great ideas coming out of those. And that seems to be a very, very good way. Yeah, it sounds like similar issues that we've been facing in Canada as well. You know, smaller populations, smaller capital pools, but the ideas are there. They just need to be backed with more risk-taking investors to give them chances to take more bets, it sounds like, which is you know something we're striving towards as well in Canada as well. I know you've relocated to Miami or you've been there for a bit. You know, what changes have you seen in that tech ecosystem recently that you're most excited about? There's a lot There's a lot going on in, uh, here in, in, in Miami. I lived in L.A. for six years and now I'm uh, completing the first year uh, in Miami. And I understand why uh, why people want to come here. The, the winter is, is outstanding. That aside, I, 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 it's a very attractive place to be for many many different reasons I see there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of people around uh, around here that um, have identified that I think one of the one of the big benefits versus um, the West Coast is also the closeness to Europe and maybe in, in a way a little bit the, the rest of the world the three hour less time difference and the few hours less uh, flying time. Um, makes everything much more uh, much more accessible. I, I do enjoy that uh, quite a bit, and uh, um, so I, I, you know, there's. I think saying, "Oh, everyone's now moving to Miami." I, I don't really see that. I think that's a, that's a bit of a, a bit of a hype. If it was happening though, um, I could understand it. And you know, I, I, I think this is way closer to being a real Silicon Beach versus uh, uh, what LA is uh, is trying to be. Wow, that's interesting. I won't uh, share that with your friends on the Los Angeles Kings Advisory Board, though. I don't know how happy they will be about that. That's a whole different thing, you know. We're we're having a uh, uh, another rebuild season, then in the next few years, we're 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 a, con a real contender again. I'm not going astray to the Florida Panthers or anyone around here. That it's once LA Kings, always LA. Kings. Don't get me started. <laughs> We've been building the Leafs, Toronto Maple Leafs for 20 years, and you've got Tampa Bay up there. So don't, uh, I'm not going to cry too much for you. <laughs> but before we wrap things up, I wanted to ask you for your uh, favorite book recommendations. And you've got a few books here that you'd like to share with the audience. Can you tell us about each one of them and why they should give them a read? I'll, I'll start with the one that we, um, that we built Boosted on. Um, and it's called Traction from um, Gina Whitman. Um, and it's a it's an enterprise um, operating system that um, when we when we first got started we 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 said this is what we want to build the company on now that we have a chance to start from scratch and then it's an amazing way to uh, put sort of a vision into into action and I think it's 
it works very well for different size companies. Um, so it, it's not just relevant for, for, for bigger or medium-sized businesses. I think there's some really good concepts in it. So we, we've built everything on it and, um, and, and that's been very successful for us. The second one is intentional integrity from Robert Chestnut. And he was the chief ethics officer at Airbnb, but he also was um, a general counsel at uh, eBay when I when I when I worked with him there. And it's uh, how smart companies can lead an ethical revolution. Um, you know that seems so um, straightforward, of course, but um, there's 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 a lot of great um, uh, inspiring thoughts in here and in, in how you can build your company grounded in in integrity so it's not just a program or something or a value it's actually something that the company has built on so i'm a big fan um, of rob in that book and then the the last one is rebooting work from maynard webb who was the CEO at, uh, at eBay, you see a, a, a theme there. He's, I'm only a COO today because I saw Maynard being such an amazing CEO. So he, he was my mentor and I'm, I'm, I'm a big Maynard web fan. And um, yeah, it's, it's, a great, it's a great book. Uh, it's a few years old now, but I think it's still relevant. It's, 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 it's a great book of um, how work has transformed in the age of entrepreneurship. So um, I very much um, recommend that. Oh, those are three great book recommendations. I mean, the fact that you built Boosted off the Traction book, and then you also worked with uh, the two authors of the two other books you uh, recommend as well is quite uh, special. Well, I want to thank you very much for joining us in the tank today, Anton, to discuss the future of e-commerce and the FBA roll-up strategy from Anton Van Ruden, uh, Boosted Commerce President and COO. Thanks so much for joining us, everyone. Take care. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. As always, if you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast. And make sure to give me a follow on Twitter or Clubhouse if you want to be in the audience and ask a question on our next Hank Talk. Till next time, 